good evening friends uh, once again we welcome you from cyan hospital and lokmanya tilak municipal medical college for our thursday pg clinics we thank dr radha gadial for giving permission for this program thank you dr parmar good evening everyone uh, i am dr akif parmar uh, i'll be Here's my case. So, two-year-old male, first by birth order, born out of third-degree consanguineous marriage, resident and hailing from Sangli, Danan Nagar by community and Hindu by religion, brought by parents with comp uh, chief complaints of loose stools since seven, day seven days. So, patient was apparently all right seven days back when he started having loose stools, about ten episodes a day, watery in consistency, green in color, foul smelling, moderate quantity, unrelated to meals, and did not resolve over time. Mother noticed it was associated with streaks of blood from day two to day four of loose stools, which was small in quantity and seen separately from stools. Mother also noticed that the patient developed hyperpigmented patches since the onset of loose stools, starting over lower limbs and spreading to involve the abdomen, back, chest, and upper limbs over the course of seven days. It was associated with peeling and had no itching or mucosal involvement. Mother noticed that the baby was being lethargic and passing less urine from day four of illness, and hence presented to the nearby hospital. During the course, there was no history of fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, no history of any introduction of new feeds or outside food consumption, no visible worms in stools, no abdominal distension or jaundice, no history of seizure, no uh, similar complaints of skin lesions in the past, no history of any allergy in the patient or family. For the above complaints, patient was taken to Meeraj Hospital, where he was admitted for two days. Patient was given one pint of uh, blood in view of lo low HB, as narrated by the mother, and was referred to Cyan as his previous medical records were from Cyan Hospital. So I would like to start with my uh, with past history, as it is significant. Uh, ANC history: patient was registered USG done four times, which were normal. Uh, birth history was a uh, full-term LSCS in view of prolonged labor. Uh, baby cried immediately after birth with a birth weight of 2.2 kilos. There was no NICU stay and baby was discharged on day of life 9. Uh, umbilical cord was seen separated on day 7 of life. Patient was gaining weight and was apparently alright until 3 months of age when he developed high-grade fever followed by one episode of paroxysmal event in the form of tonic movement of left upper limb which was lasting for 5 minutes. He was taken to a nearby hospital where he was admitted in ICU, was kept on mechanical ventilation for about 3 days. Uh, one pint of blood was given in an ICU. Uh, there was no history of bleeding from any side. Some investigation was done, uh, probably lumbar puncture, which was suggestive of an infection in the brain. A patient received medications through uh, the IV and was admitted for a period of total 15 days. And patient was sent home on some uh, anti-seizure medications. After that, patient was apparent. Uh, patient was discharged on the stable vitals. He was apparently all right for 15 days at home until uh, when he developed cough, cold, and fever. Uh, he was told. Mother was told that the patient has developed pneumonia and was admitted for seven days at the nearby hospital. During this course, uh, oxygen was delivered for about three days. Uh, no blood products were transfused. Uh, and uh, after seven days, patient was discharged on stable vitals. After about one month at home, patient again developed cough, cold and fever. Mother noticed that the baby was neither smiling towards her nor was he able to hold his head, which was previously possible. Patient was then referred to CTC Borivli uh, from the nearby hospital in view of further management and decreased cells in blood as informed by the doctor to the parents. Uh, following which an MRI was done which showed some blood collection in the skull which needed some surgical intervention. However, there was no history of head trauma, no repeat episode of convulsion and no bleeding from any other site. Again, one, uh, uh, one pint of uh, blood was transfused before the surgery. Surgery was done in July 2021 at Cyan Hospital, following which patient developed fever right after the surgery and required a stay for about 14 days. Uh, parents were also told during this stay that he has some enlargement of the liver. 
patient after this stay was sent back to CTC Borivli. Uh, a test was done which uh, involved removing fluid from the bone, which was sent to KEM for investigations, the reports of which were told to be normal to the parents. And uh, then the patient was discharged on stable vitals. This was his third admission at the age of four months. Then at the age of nine months, patient was again admitted in view of pneumonia at the local hospital for two days. Patient was then transferred to Cyan in an ambulance uh, in view of further management as his previous records were from Cyan Hospital. Antibiotics were given for seven days and was then discharged on stable vitals. During the course, there was no blood products transfused. After the age of nine months, uh, pa uh, patient was lost to follow up. He was then having a history of on and off fever for about two to three episodes a month. Patient was not admitted at, at any other hospital and medications were taken locally. The episodes lasted for about two to three days uh, of 100 degree Fahrenheit. And uh, mother also uh, admitted that uh, he had poor weight gain at home. Developmental history, uh, gross motor, uh, the last uh, milestone to have achieved was walking with support at 24 months with DQ of 46%. Fine motor eats with spoon with spillage at 20 months, DQ of 57. Language, bisyllable at 24 months with DQ of 34%. And social, he could wave bye-bye at 1.5 years, a DQ of 34%. So overall developmental quotient was 42.7% indicating global developmental delay. Immunization was up to date. There were no adverse effects following immunization. His dietary history was uh, uh, suggestive of deficit in energy and proteins. Uh, there were no similar complaints in the family. He was the only child. Uh, socioeconomic status, he belonged to a lower middle class.
So again, ask questions, keeping in mind what you have to consider with this. Otherwise, normally we don't ask for appetite. But if I'm talking about malabsorption, then appetite is retained. He's feeding and Trauma, if there is any history, if there are patches elsewhere, if it has happened in the past. Most is important is changing color. Color of that. Okay. You would have asked that. Now, how would you ask such questions if you start thinking about every word that is put up there? So earlier we said the history taking is thought in action. You think and act, uh, ask a question. All these questions could have made it clear. thing we could do now, we could go to the first episode and pick up whether this host is abnormal. Here we clearly know the host is abnormal. Okay. Get to the first episode at three months of age. Okay. So at and let's see whether we could have anticipated a problem. Okay. Because past history clearly tells you host is abnormal. Okay. And he's getting repeated infection, so it is immunological. Okay. It's so clear. But the question is, could we have made out on the first episode of illness? So who will analyze the first episode of illness? During the first episode of illness of at the age of three months, patient had developed high grade fever followed by one episode of paroxysmal event in the form of tonic movement of left upper limb. The episode lasted for about five minutes patient was taken to the yeah, nearby so hospital. What does this mean to you? Is it a simple febrile seizure? Uh, no, sir. Age group. It is focal, sir. Left upper limb, so it is not simple. Sir. So, atypical febrile seizure. Three months, Three months. age doesn't fit. So and um, the child was sick uh, and required mechanical ventilation. It is later. So, how do you, how do you analyze this? Do you want to know when the seizure occurred? Meaning in the timing of the fever, is that important? Yes. And At the height of fever spike, he developed... First day. For, uh, day yeah. one. Yes, sir. On fe uh, fever within was... 24 hours of Within fever. 24 hours of the fever, uh, he developed a convulsion. So, what do you think of that? So, when it happens at three months, fever and within 24 hours seizure, what does it, what are your thoughts? Meningitis, because such a small, the age group, three months old, and there is not much uh, of time lapse between the initial symptom and the convulsion also. So. I think again pick up what is unusual. Okay. He is gaining weight. He must be on breastfeeds only. He is at home. Why should he get an, any disease at all? That should be your first thought. It's not that you can't get a disease. But well breastfed baby at home in close environment, no more contacts. It's unusual. Okay. That's the first point. Second is we don't have the clear details of when did the fever start and when did the paroxysmal event come. But it appears it came immediately one after another. 
What does that convey to you? You must have seen bacterial meningitis, fever, irritability, vomiting, a day or two later a seizure. In meningitis, seizure is the end story. In an encephalitis, the seizure is the beginning story. Okay, if I just put up to simplify it, if it's a viral infection, there has to be a contact in the family of a viral infection, whatever, cold cough, we could have asked that. If it was not there, then it was unlikely viral. Okay. If there is no contact, viral unlikely, bacterial unlikely. Because why suddenly a seizure? Therefore, the organism is moving extremely fast. Unusual rapid illness. Again, an immune deficiency. If the history should be that. He says that, yes, fever and seizure and mechanical ventilation, encephalopathy. So this must be a bacterial meningitis which has gone so fast, in the next 12 hours he is encephalopathic, he is on ventilation, which is very unusual for a bacterial meningitis. Go many other ways. You must have seen many seizures. Have you seen a three-month-old coming with seizure? While any infection can come at any time. Seizures are generally perinatal, hypoxic ischemic, hypocalcemic, meningitis, whatever. Thereafter, there is a little silent gap till simple febrile seizures start coming after six months. Not that it doesn't occur, but something unusual. So point is, like the other day we were discussing cardiac, if a three-month-old child comes with cough and breathlessness going on for four or five days, first possibility is the left or right, <coughs> simply by that age. So there are so many abnormalities. And one could have said, we'll treat this meningitis, whatever, but we will not leave this child. We will investigate what is it. Okay, and I think that is important. Could, could there be some congenital malformation that has led to infection? Which congenital malformation may leave a possibility of an intracranial infection? And we could easily pick it up on clinical examination, etc. So there has to be an entry of organism directly. How it could be? Maybe a meningomyelocele. But obviously that would have come up to easily our impression. <coughs> There's no reason why there is a head trauma. Otherwise, a head trauma can have a sphenoid bone fracture, uh, ear illness. Okay, all those are secondary causes of yeah. Okay, there has been possibly nothing of that kind. So the point again I'm making is, we saw how two-month-old we could have picked up immune deficiency. We are seeing how three-month-old also could be picked up as an immune deficiency. Okay, there's no reason why he should be left alone without any further treatment, right? So now, what kind of immune deficiency are you thinking of? Any thoughts on that? What kind of immune deficiency? Also, just one more point before that is, why do you think the PRC was given in this, to this patient? Since we are dis dissecting each point, any thoughts on that? Iatrogenic. Uh, it could be iatrogenic because of multiple blood sampling. One. I would expect that for a newborn probably, for a, with a prolonged stay or a preterm with prolonged stay, but not for a three-month-old. How much blood are you going to take out of a three-month-old to make him anemic, him or her anemic? So any IVH. Okay, IVH is one possibility. Again, three-month-old IVH, there's no reason for three-month-old. Could be a localized bleed because focal seizures also. Okay. Some Fair and enough. very sudden onset, immediately okay. fever followed. I was thinking more in terms of recovering, hemo uh, recovering from nadir, so it's still going to be low and on mechanical ventilation, so you want a better oxygen carrying capacity. That could be one of the indication for um, giving a transfusion at a higher threshold, higher hemoglobin compared to a routine hemoglobin. 
positions. It's not patient. easy to connect a fall in hemoglobin with the febrile illness. And no, no. So that's why I'm not connecting yeah. those two. I'm saying no, uh, telling them. Yeah. What type of immunodeficiency would you think about? We are grouping them first, right? We are not going to spot, make a spot diagnosis unless there are certain pointers, at least till now they are not there. So at three months of age, the maternal antibodies are present. Uh, so B cell defect would not be causing such a drastic course. It's probably some T cell defect or combined. Or combined. Very good. Next one. But would you have made, uh, would you have been thinking about immunodeficiency at this point in time if you are the treating physician? <coughs> that is the question. Yes or no? How many have for yes? How many would have said yes? Even after, at least after this class today. Sir Serious. just said na, that Sir if said there is no sir. reason, then you have to start thinking na, why he got <coughs> meningitis. This second illness, this pneumonia, any thoughts on that? Cough, cold, fever, was pneumonia in seven days admitted, O2 given. I just want you to keep thinking all the time. So out of these three lines, what thoughts come to your mind? So it could be related to the previous admission because the child was mechanically ventilated. So. He could be predisposed Very to good. have a pneumonia. Okay. What else? Is this a bacterial infection or a viral infection? Viral. Because Why do you the say child so? required short, short uh, oxygen course and uh, the stay was only for seven days. Apparently. So again, two, three points. One is what is, means if you can get the details in the history, whether fever was prominent, whether cough was prominent, whether it started all at the same time like they do in a viral infection, that is important. And if it was bacterial infection, means it could well have been a viral infection. That's my point, which got bad. That's the point. This next one is uh, what? Third admission was at four months of age, where he developed cough cold fever. And uh, mother also noticed some specific points where uh, she d noticed that the patient was not smiling towards her, nor was he able to hold his head, which was previously possible. And then referred to uh, Borevli in view of further management. And uh, the doctor had informed her that uh, patient's uh, cells in the blood is are low. No, but can you give us some more details about <laughs> the history, except because, you know, there's only a one-liner here for this episode. Uh, so about one month of... Uh, so that age is four and a half months, approximately? Four months. Four months. Okay. Four months of age, he again developed a cough cold fever, uh, and he was admitted at a local hospital. So uh, the treating doctor there noticed some uh, decrease in cell lines in the blood. and in view of previous significant two history, uh, two history, uh, he was referred, he was referred to a higher center for further workup. Mm -hmm. This is all the mother could. Sit. So we are not very clear on the sequence of events because if you are saying that the mother uh, noticed that he was not able to hold his head, which he was earlier able to hold, does that? You are trying to convey something? Um, so there was some insult in the brain. Uh, further no, so up. when will a child who is holding head stop holding head? What would it mean? It can be encephalopathy, lethargy, with Which fever. is the overall uh, deterioration of the child, no? What else? Developmental regression. Okay, so developmental regression. Mm. 
anything else Due to the acute illness, he may not be uh, showing the milestones he's already achieved. Also, he had a seizure in the past admission. So that also can cause an insult to causing the developmental delay. So the question is, is it neuroregression or is it something else which is causing this so called whatever the history is being said more about more likely an acute illness he's been in the icu for so long than another admission after 15 days and his nutrition also must be uh, hampered during that period so. okay means my point is that that mri was done and it showed a blood collection i'm not able to correlate ki why an mri was done and from the history, would you have suspected a blood collection there? There was no history. Of, uh, so, so, no, sorry, even just one minute. So the point that we both were trying to make is that whatever this loss of so-called milestone has to be with another precipitating event and not because of the pre-existing problem. Because if he was not to hold the head, he would have stopped holding the head at the time of discharge from the, uh, from the episode of meningitis. A child with meningitis who, was con who continued to hold his head will not stop holding his head for no reason after one month or one and a half month. That's what we are trying to say. Yeah. Mm. Only one aspect is that post meningitic, has there been any space occupation? And what kind of space occupation? Hydrocephalus, okay, uh, multiple brain abscesses, more than hematomas. Because this child is young, he could have multiple brain abscesses and almost present like a hydrocephalus. But when you do an ultrasound, when the anterior fountain is open, you suddenly get a surprise that you have multiple brain abscesses there. So something space occupying. But one would not have considered a hematomas there because he said blood was withdrawn. So that's something unusual unless he has some pathological bleeding. Okay, sepsis, but that should not just bleed like this intracranially. Vitamin K worsening, maybe absorption is not there, earlier not given vitamin K. So, maybe multiple reasons why they found it, but some space occupation. Maybe it was the uh, manifestation of bleed, because pri uh, when he had meningitis, even that time it was an acute rampant uh, event. Uh, and he was kept on, uh, so maybe that was, that was the first time he bled and this is another bleeding episode which has occurred. No, no, did he have bleed at the first time? Uh, he may have. Uh, uh, okay. Yes, sir, so you are saying possibly there was bleed at that time yes. also. Okay, fine, fair enough. So, just one more question before we go ahead. So, you know, though now we know that even in the first episode we would have started thinking about immunodeficiency for this child for the reason that sir explained. But for some reason you did not think when would be, when at what point in his life that you would have said no this is immunodeficiency and I am going to investigate thoroughly for that as soon as I am, I have taken care of the acute problem. the second episode admission of pneumonia, we could thought of uh, immunodeficiency. Fair enough. So, when do you think about immunodeficiency, primary immunodeficiency in general? Apart from, sir said, unusual presentation, unusual organism, etc. Suppose Dr. Rajesh gave a very nice talk recently on recurrent problems get hold of the link I will share it with you. So that recurrent, how many infections would make you suspect that the child has primary immunodeficiency? Answer. So four, or a, uh, four or more ear infections. Very just, good. Um, two respi infections. Say it loudly, no, I cannot hear you. Four or more ear infections, uh, two chest infections, um, any uh, uh, infection requiring IV antibiotics, not uh, any, but any, any unusual unu site, uh, unusual organism. Uh, Deep-seated deep infections. infections. Okay. 
So when we say unusual, means some signature bugs if you. You have a spur, S-P-U-R, serious, persistent, unusual, recurrent. Any of these, or many of these together. Okay, that gives you a possibility of a immune deficiency. Anybody who has suffered from a spur would know how irritating and nagging that spur is. So that's what immunodeficiencies are. So why do you think this child has developmental delay? Because of the CNS infection and insult to brain, at ma ma there have been multiple admissions as well. So that could have caused the delay in development of miles. So I want you to split hair. Suppose somebody is admitted many times for various illnesses. Would he or she have this kind of a delay? So in short, suppose you would have not had meningitis but had everything else. Would you have expected developmental delay? Forget the severity. If the child is sick, motor delay is more compared to the Very fine good. language. And if the child is sick frequently, motor delay is going to be more significant than other delays. Yeah. Nutritional deprivation will also come in. Will also the child. lead to largely gross, gross motor, motor delay. delay. But we are discussing meningitis at three months, right? <coughs> meningitis causes delay in. Where is the brain cell involved? It's only the meninges involved. A pleural disease is different than the parenchymal disease, no? Okay. You have a tuberculous pleural effusion in a healthy child. If he doesn't have anything in parenchyma. You drain his fluid, treat him, he's absolutely normal. So why should meningitis <coughs> cause delay? Post-meningitic inflammation, gliosis. Okay. So in other words, is meningitis in a three-month-old different from meningitis of a ten-year-old? Yes. A three-month-old meningitis can cause significant delay because the brain is still developing up to two years of age. And so then at three months, it's a meningoencephalitis. But to begin with meningitis, you are mistreating meningitis early. So it quickly becomes encephalitis. In which case, could it be TB itself? TB is classically meningoencephalitis. TB child comes with seizure, then drowsiness, then hydrocephalus. Oh, perfect. At three months, he had TB meningitis. Takes a longer, TB meningitis will take a longer latent period to develop. And three months is very atypical age for TB meningitis. Without AKT, he improved. Without the anti-tubercular medication, he improved, so... But there's no history of, like, the duration of treatment. So my question is to you, does a three-month-old commonly develop TB meningitis? And if not, why not? He should be the first to disseminate everywhere. Maternal and... He's so small. Have you seen neonate? with congenital TB and TB meningitis. Why not? He's at tremendous risk. He's at neonate. He's a three-month-old. He should have gone all over. So why does neonate or small infant not develop TBM but could have very bad spread out tuberculosis? Maternal antibody? Probably. I'm good. What kind of a disease is TBM in terms of pathophysiology? Granulomatous to TB only. Myco. Is Myco. it a hypersensitivity reaction? So there needs to be some time for the baby to form hypersensitivity before it can react to that in hypersensitivity. Therefore, at that age, the child has a disseminated TB, but no organ showing hypersensitivity. So there could be congenital TB, liver, spleen, yes. 
or at three months he gets an acquired TB. It could be miliary TB. There could be miliary in the brain also, but not brain cell affection. Two things are different because there is no hypersensitivity. And when there is a hypersensitivity, there is a damage. Okay. If there is no hypersensitivity and you treat them early enough and good enough, they may come out much better. If there is a hypersensitivity, damage is done, even in spite of your successful therapy, they are going to be developmentally delayed. And so when you have, when you are thinking of primary immunodeficiency and specifically T cell or macrophage, deficiencies, defects. So then they can, you can have excessive mycobacterial infections, but again, as Sir said, you can divide it between the, on the basis of pathophysiology. We'll go to the examination. So what's your provisional diagnosis after history? How will you summarize and give a provisional diagnosis? So two-year-old male child born out of third degree consanguineous marriage. Uh, coming with uh, complaints of l uh, loose tools and uh, coming with multiple uh, admissions requiring multiple blood transfusions in the past. Uh, having, uh, having received surgical intervention and... Uh, so I think some key words you need to add. So Chalo, you help him. We'll, we'll make the summary later, but first say what should, what key words or phrases should come in the summary. We don't want to again say loose motions and all, no? So how will you describe all these? What are all these? Recurrent infections, major or minor? Major. Involving same system or different systems? Multiple systems. Rapidly progressive or slowly progressive? So all this should come in your description to give a summary and then say so suggestive of. Okay? Moving on to the examination, uh, when the child presented to us, uh, there was wasting seen. Pulse was 130 per minute, respiratory rate of 30. SPO2 was 99 and uh, he was maintaining circulation. On head to toe examination, brachycephaly was noted, AF was closed, there was pinched up nose, uh, low set ears, pallor was seen, uh, eyes, ears and nose were normal, uh, colitis was seen, there was rachetic rosary, hyperpigmented patch uh, over the body associated with scaling, nails were normal, there was thin dry skin, bilateral pitting, uh, bilateral Pitting pedal edema up to knee and penile swelling. Uh, there are a few photographs. So, uh, it's not clear in the photo of the light. So, in the first picture, there were multiple. Uh, Hyperpigmented patches associated with scaling uh, on the dorsal aspect of the thigh, and uh, in the second picture there is colitis can be seen. Uh, again, in the third image we can see the uh, extensive involvement of the skin. Uh, on anthropometry, uh, you. Uh, Weight was less than minus 3 standard deviation, height was less than minus 3 standard deviation, MUAC less than minus 3 standard deviation, and weight for height less than minus 3 sta standard deviation. Head circumference was maintained, was normal. So uh, anthropometrically, he was uh, severely acute malnutrition. Uh, systemic examination, uh, CVS, uh, CNS, and uh, his systemic examination was normal. So. Uh, 47 centimeter minus 2 to minus 1 standard deviation. Uh, so, impression. 
टू ईयर ओल्ड बॉय कम्प्लेनिंग ऑफ लूज टूल्स विद इंटरमीडियंट ब्लीडिंग विद न्यूट्रिशनल डर्माटोसिस विद मल्टीपल पास्ट मल्टीपल हिस्ट्री ऑफ ब्लड ट्रांसफ्यूजन एंड मल्टीपल एडमिशन फॉर निमोनिया रैपिडली प्रोग्रेसिव एंड विद स्पॉन्टेनियस इंट्राक्रीनियल हीमरेज रिक्वायरिंग एवेक्यूएशन विद ग्लोबल डेवलपमेंटल डीले एंड इम्यूनाइजेशन अप टू डेट and uh, diet deficit in calories and proteins with signs of micronutrient and vitamin d3 deficiency uh, se- severely acute malnutrition with uh, normal systemic examination is probably a case of uh, sec- uh, secondary immuno deficiency uh, secondary immuno deficiency probably nutritional uh, second differential is primary immuno deficiency uh, we was got altric and uh third would be megaloplastic anemia fourth aplastic anemia this one so discuss each of the differentials someone take up the first one just say points for and against he won't get angry if you say things against him i'm sure say what are the points in favor of secondary immunodeficiency as the primary diagnosis no idea so you've seen many malnourished children what kind of infections do they get bacterial she said bacterial where what are the common infections you've seen in malnourished children diarrhea then pneumonia okay pneumonia then ear infection ear infections then skin lesions now what is the story of this malnourished child as in in terms of time frame so what comes first nutritional is uh, unlikely in this child he started with a well thriving child at 3 month he had uh, meningitis and again at 4 15 days later pneumonia after that again uh, this illness so it started earlier than nutritional deficiency and uh, very good so essentially in a malnourished child the malnutrition is first event and then that leads to some infections here you had a 3 month well breastfed baby getting the first infection at which time he was not malnourished right and then over time you have found malnutrition so it's almost ulta that the infections have led to malnutrition right so first one is not tenable what about second one GDD goes a little against the second one so other features fit GDD in GDD is global developmental delay global delivery. developmental okay. delay sorry you. goes a little against viscot aldrich so primary immuno deficiencies would have normal development so, but so so let's dissect it this way first do you agree with primary immuno deficiency yes. if so then whether is viscot aldrich or something else we can discuss later Yes, I agree with primary immune deficiency because he's had unusual infections at unusual ages, like so I said, repeated infections, which was serious, requiring admission. And Fair enough. Uh-huh. So now, what do you think? Uh, now, why would you think of Scott Aldrich? We'll discuss points for, and then we'll discuss points against, if any. So, why would you think of Scott Aldrich? because he had that skin lesion as one of the manifestation and eczema as a part of the trial and he said uh, many cell lines were deficient no so that was that skin lesion didn't look like eczema no mm. it looked more like a hyperpigmentation. hyperpigmentation seen in a malnourished child so that's and one did, and did that lesion come up early on in the disease no, no. 
or right. late in the disease. Later on. And which is the commonest infection with Viscot Aldrich? Okay. Ear discharge, infection. right? Viscot Aldrich typically. See, uh, each or at least some of the immunodeficiencies have some characteristic pattern. Like we said, eczema for, him, for Viscot Aldrich. Same way, wet ears and wet skin. So that is how Viscot Aldrich would look like. And you said multiple cell lines. So how? clinically, how would you bring in that multiple cell lines? Uh, so multiple cell lines and he had a spontaneous bleed. So that would justify... Uh, but why do you say multiple cell lines? First, I am not very sure about multiple cell lines. That's what I am saying. Because, yeah. because I mean, if you are saying intracranial bleed suggested platelets, where are the petechial spots? Where are the purpuric spots? Why not a coagulation defect? Correct. So, bleeding can occur because of coagulation defect also with completely normal cell lines. One can have primary immunodeficiency with a normal cell line. Because bone marrow and everything also he had mentioned in his... He did mention... No, that's nice. Marrow. He is very resourceful. He has got all the information for you. You may not always have. And just as a, as a pointer, in the exam when you present, you can say marrow, marrow is done. But I would personally prefer not to discuss the report. Because again, it's hearsay. Okay. So what is normal, abnormal, whatever it was, you can say bone marrow was done. That's fine. So that you know that the history has been captured properly. Sir. Can it be sub uh, skid? Because we started by saying severe infection. So sometimes when you can't find something, you want to rule out certain things. You say, okay, at least this is not this. Can this be skid? Simple questions, simple first. Could be, but no skin lesions, no your discharge, okay. all of it. These are the more common infections. What Only is the lifespan of skid idea. usually? They usually don't survive beyond their first birthday, unfortunately, unless treated aggressively. So that way you can also think that the severity, those looks more, baby is still around and managed. You have seen many malnourished children. How often you have seen meningitis? Sam, how often meningitis? Pneumonias, yes. Diarrheas, yes. Okay. Meningitis? Why not? My next question, leading you to the first question's answer is, how do the bacteria reach the meninges? Blood-brain blood -brain barrier. barrier. There has to be a break in the blood-brain barrier. So. so it has to go through the blood? Yes. Okay. Directly rare. <coughs> okay. Then why does a child who is malnourished gets pneumonia does not get his blood also carrying bacteria to the meninges? The blood-brain barrier. So the point is that he succumbs to that. He comes for pneumonia. He comes for diarrhea. And that gets worse. Okay. To that extent, we already said three months old he was gaining weight well, etc. So no question at all. But generally, a SAM comes with repeated diarrhea, pneumonia, etc. That too at the far end of SAM. Okay. Yes. And they are easily controllable. Okay. In spite of malnutrition. You hit the right antibiotic and you are all right. So, that, that is totally out. What about megaloblastic anemia? It doesn't explain everything. There will be a megaloblastic anemia. After all, two main causes of hyperpigmentation of this kind is adrenal and the B12. So that's fine. But that's not the cause. And does aplastic anemia cause all this? Why should aplastic anemia not cause infections? Your WBCs are down, no? Then is aplastic anemia presentation with recurrent infections? They can't then why not? Bleeding manifestations are more common. Some platelet, uh, uh, because of the low platelet count, child will present with bleeding manifestation rather than more infection. But why not? Don't have WBCs to mount the infection. 
the the response to the infection they cannot mount. So the point is, is that aplastic anemia is present is largely as anemia. <coughs> and on examination you might find also bleeding, but rarely presents as bleeding. That is number one. <coughs> but WBC is not the only defense in the body. There are enough defense soldiers in the body. WBC is just one of them. Okay. And it may not be functionally abnormal, it's quantitative why it's abnormal. Therefore, a, pl a plastic anemia will not come with infections also. Well, he may get infected, that's different, but recurrent is out. So, a plastic anemia can't be cause of all this. Megaloblastic anemia is not cause of all this. Primary nutrition is not the all cause of this. So, we are left with immune deficiency only. Okay. The question is, which kind of immune deficiency? So I asked a question, you have to answer. Which subclass? T cell or combined? T immunity. cell or combined, okay. Accepted. Further? Any pointers on history for any particular diagnosis? None. Because he does not have recurrent pneumonia also. Yes. So it's not localized only to skin, localized only to one system. That's why Dr. Rajesh asked in the summary whether it's not only recurrent, unusual, but localized to one system. And that is also important because if it is localized to one system, then you may look at some other reason, like a structural problem or a functional problem or a clearance problem of that particular system and not a generalized primary immunodeficiency. You have different lesions at different infections from different systems, then you are more thinking in terms of primary immunodeficiency. So how will you bring in that bleeding and the PRC transfusions and how will you try to correlate it to this? And you will have to give some explanation in the exam. So what will you say? Can the bleeding be due to coagulation disorders? Let's discuss that. Yes, sir, it can be because these are deep-seated uh, ble uh, bleeds, uh, not superficial bleeds. Uh, so coagulation can be one of the... Correct. So now go one step further. Which coagulation disorder you have seen which presents with intracranial bleed? You've seen hemophilias, you've seen so many. Small babies. Factor 7. Factor 7. Okay. Factor Vitamin K related. Correct. So HDN, late HDN. Okay. So now you have to try and see if there's any correlation of vitamin and K in yeah. this whole story. And hemophilia, of course, can come with intracranial bleed, but We'll have some trauma, some even trivial, there has to be some injury or trauma, no spontaneous bleeding there. So, I mean, for exam discussion, you may say that this child has received repeated courses of antibiotics and whether that has affected vitamin K, I don't know. But surely in this child, they saw the reason for doing a bone marrow, because all three shells line. Why should that have occurred? We are thinking of recurrent infection, meningitis, pneumonia, etc. There was certainly a pancytopenia in the peripheral smear, so they went to the bone marrow. Okay, and they said possibly it was normal. Mm. So, why does pancytopenia come in this child? There was PID and he had an infection like CMV or some infection infecting the bone marrow that could cause pancytopenia. Any serious infection would suppress the bone, bone marrow. The point is, we have a whole story. If we ignore that story, then you look at aplastic anemia by a hematologist, they would say, we must do a bone marrow. Okay. But look at the whole story. There is no question of doing a bone marrow in this child. My one, another question related to that, suppose you found that there was pancytopenia, even in megaloblastic anemia you find that, 
Okay. Would there be any indicator in a peripheral CBC or a peripheral smear to tell you that the bone marrow is all right? I'll give you a specific thing. I see a thrombocytopenic child. Should I do a bone marrow? Then I must convince myself by a test, peripheral test, that bone marrow is normal. A reticulocyte count or an immature platelet fraction? Reticulocyte count, good. And about platelet? Immature platelet fraction. Very good. Mega platelets on the peripheral smear. If you see a large platelet, it's coming from bone marrow. Okay. So, to a generalist, one could have done those simple things even before doing a bone marrow. But the problem is we always feel it's not, medicine is not so simple, so we must rule out all that. That's why they must have done it. Also, if you look at, also if you, also if you look at the MCV, then the degree of rise in MCV, you can categorize and say whether it is aplastic or megaloplastic or falsely elevated MCV as we discussed some time before because of rule formation in certain autoimmune hemolytic anemias. So now before he tells us investigations, you all tell us how will you investigate this baby. And also tell us how, as sir said, how will you suspect immunodeficiency with simple investigations. Chalo, let's start with simple. CBC. Uh, what do you want to look at? The absolute neutrophil count, the hold, hold. counts, the cell. Uh, hold like this. The WBC count and the individual cell count neutrophils. So tell us something more about it. No? So individual cell count means you are looking at neutrophils. Yes. What will neutrophils tell you for this patient? Uh, so he's asking how will you suspect on a CBC that this could be immunodeficiency or trouble? Not for this particular patient. Generally primary immunodeficiency looking at neutrophils what information you may get? Very high neutrophils. The neutrophils are high. We okay. suspect leukocyte addition. Okay. Defects. That's very right. What about the next one? Lymphocytes? lymphocytes. So, what do you look at lymphocytes for? What information you get from lymphocytes? It's actually an additional screening test, can be used as screening test. Cell, cell mediated immunodeficiency, cell, cellular immunodeficiency. Cell cell. T cell, T cell. T cell uh, immunodeficiency. So if there is lymphopenia and the values vary from 2500 to 2700 of ALC, absolute lymphocyte count, then you can suspect possibility of T cell primary immunodeficiency. But the other way it is true. If you get more than 2700, then you are most likely not dealing with a T cell deficiency. T cell or combined, whatever you want to call it. Then platelets. Come on, come on, Numbers. quick, quick. Numbers and morphology of platelets. And the uh, size, size of, of the platelets. platelets. Okay. So small size, platelets are normal size, then you are not thinking of Viscott Aldrich. Correct? Because most of these things are like screening tests. You won't come to a diagnosis from there, but you can say, okay, this doesn't look like this particular condition. What other tests you'll do? Peripheral smear. CBC includes peripheral smear, right? So what you don't see on peripheral sphere will make you say that this is not happening. <coughs> Something is absent from birth. <coughs> Asplenia, right? So if there is congenital absence of spleen, you should see 
how will jolly bodies how will jolly bodies correct yeah very good so if you don't see those then you know okay this child has a spleen right then after cbc what do you want to do cultures also unusual organisms so all blood cultures urine cultures if there is any discharge then the discharge collects you want to do antibody levels antibody profiles igg igm etc what else do you want to do chest x ray to look for thymus okay chest x ray for thymus very good what else your point is very well taken but that's usually in a smaller baby in a 2 year old child if you don't see a thymus you may not be able to make us make a connection between the two okay okay tell us what tell what investigation mm. uh, lymphocytes okay uh, these investigations were done uh, so the first investigation done was on 1st of april 2021 where the platelets were low uh, but wbc was maintained there was bicytopenia and a normal mpv uh, as you can see the trend of platelets have always been low uh, throughout his life uh, hb it is seen falling gradually and then prcs were uh, given so <coughs> and even after that uh, it is on the falling trend Uh, then recently, uh, during the course of our stay, we uh, did a PS and where large platelets were seen. So, uh, CSF analysis during the first admission was done, where it showed a WBC of six, six hundred and sixty poly dominant, and uh, growth rev uh, cultures revealed staph aureus growth. Uh, repeat uh, lumbar puncture was done which was showed to the se uh, settling of infection and other investigations that were done uh, bone marrow biopsy uh, bone marrow aspiration nbt these all of these reports were normal these are all the investigations i could extract so the 10 warning signs which so what is your presumptive diagnosis in this child uh, yes. uh, given the history and multiple uh, no after investigations how will you so these investigations do not completely rule out uh, Im primary immunodeficiency uh, it's an umbrella term it has many more aspects towards uh, to it so a lim a lymphocyte subs subset as a can tell us uh, if there is functional uh, defect in the wbcs causing requ uh, multiple repeated hospitalizations uh, total immunoglobulin was not done so why was it not done uh, means i'm i'm not complaining i'm asking for a logical reason initially maternal antibodies were yeah so you said right in the beginning na no, that you are not suspecting a b cell defect here mm -hmm. so that's not high on your cards right mm -hmm. have you confirmed viscot aldrich or you ruled out viscot aldrich so large platelets were seen on ps so uh, it's a possibility it's a possibility uh, was uh, ws gene has been sent uh, from the words uh, awaiting the results okay Uh -huh. He said there was a delayed separation of the cord. So is that seven. important? Day seven, seven days. Seven days. Seven days yeah. Is that normal? Factor thirteen deficiency can be. Because one of the <coughs> markers of immune deficiency is the delayed separation of cord. The book says it is more than two so weeks. So why it took seven days? More than two weeks is significant. 
uh, more than two uh, uh, time period of two weeks is environment decides that in a hot summer it will dry up fast but in winter even in india and in some states it will take a long time to <coughs> and of course one more reason is if you keep on putting some ointment something there then the wetness continues for even a long time so that is one then this child had a sham right and he said no liver no spleen i thought malnutrition children will have a liver if not the spleen Agreed, no? Fatty liver. Okay. Why? Why no liver at all? So when there is a severe calorie malnutrition, comparatively less of protein deficiency, proportionately, then you get <coughs> atrophy of all organs. Okay, and the liver also may be very small. Even microcardia, small heart. So this child must be very severely calorie malnourished, and if he is getting very little calorie, <coughs> then if he is getting eight or ten percent of those calories from proteins, he may not develop protein deficiency signs, though he is short of proteins as per his age, but proportionately he must be getting enough protein for that small calories. Therefore, he doesn't have much of clinical signs of protein. If he started at three months of age. SCID, the most common severe combined immune deficiency. But one thought I want you to discuss is: Could it be an HIV transmitted from mother? And how would you consider it in this situation? That's also an immune deficiency. Any thoughts on that? Can be an HIV infection in the child also, but there was a lot of period when he was apparently all right also after I think the second admission, he was and the mother on family history also we can find out if the mother is on. So just to acknowledge uh, Dr. Palinaman, Dr. Bharti, Dr. Anjali, Dr. Prajakta for their very active interaction on the chat. Thank you. How will you? Uh, treat this child. So overall, what is the management of this child? Yes, uh, so we're all in, in, the in the course of the ward, uh, cultures were sent uh, and uh, he has developed multiple episodes of loose tools. The loose tools have not subsided, uh, but there is no streaks of blood uh, in the uh, stools. Uh, the cultures <laughs> have been sent uh, Primarily for bacterial cult uh, cultures, which have come out to be negative. We uh, now we are suspecting some fungal component, uh, uh, and and antibiotic uh, antibiotics are going on. So you should always talk of other general management like nutritional Nutrition management, nutritionally prevention of complications. Uh, nutritionally, uh, to address this problem. Uh, he is vitally he is sta uh, stable and uh, he started him on uh, MNT. So, uh, <coughs> started on sorry uh, medical nutrition therapy. Medical. Yeah. Uh, and okay. <coughs> anything else anybody wants to say or ask? Can it be cystic fibrosis also as there is a recurrent infections with uh, all fat soluble vitamin deficiencies and uh, sinopulmonary infections, meningitis? So anybody wants to discuss this? Our question is can it can should we think of cystic fibrosis? No. Clinically first you tell us Clinically, tell us why it is less likely. Recurrent pneumonia. Recurrent pneumonia is not that there's one pneumonia. There's recurrent bleeds. Bleeds are also unlikely. Uh, there would have been constipation or uh, the like secretory uh, obstruction related symptoms more of. Uh, 
like uh, airway or uh, secretion if get obliterated then pneumonia is or constipation mm -hmm. basically it's a disease of the pulmonary airways so that should be your chief complaint and your early complaint here the whole story started with a meningitis the first episode right so it doesn't really fit into cystic fibrosis yeah so we'll uh, end this case here and uh, the second part of today's class is a, a discussion on lab diagnosis of anemia by dr palni raman from pondicherry he is one of the regular faculty for this class when we were doing it online also okay yeah dr palni raman you can start yeah uh, we can we can see the ppt okay right okay uh, very good evening my dear ambedkar sir and my dear colleagues and my dear students first of all i thank uh, the iap for this opportunity <laughs> coming to the uh, utility of cbc in hematology it's really a phenomenal utility we do have with respect to hematology particularly when the patient presents with uh, uh, like a pallor or bleeding they usually we deal with the primary hematological problems and the utility of cbc is great even though comparatively we do cbc for in the day to day practice mainly in case of fever to fish out the infections but even though there the utility is not so great it is the most common test then but often with incomplete interpretation and with a cursory appraisal ideally it should be accompanied by peripheral smear study normally when we see a smear report or when we see a mainly the printer report we see what happens that that is hemoglobin tcdc and platelet that's it but we don't go into the details of each and every part but the the details of the strip is a treasure and which can give rise to plenty of diagnosis when you go through the strips properly let us see how far the day to day cbc is very useful in our day to day practice and particularly the automation has changed the entirety previously the manual tcdc is a very very today one hemoglobin tomorrow one hemoglobin now with automation and the standardization the error is less than 1% it is easily reliable and see to that the quality control is maintained and go to their lab go to your pathology lab you see what the machine is there how they are maintaining the quality control how the smear is done how the thing definitely it plays a major role particularly to improve yourself with respect to day to day hematological cases this is the standardized machine which do i have in my center that is the sysmex kx21 is a internationally accredited uh, machine as well as the microscope which do i have in my table and uh, here are the persons two great persons that is valles coulter and joe coulter who invented the coulter principle way back in the 1950s in the basement of chicago basement and the first coulter machine was mainly introduced installed at the children medical center in boston 1958 let us go through a simple basic what is a coulter principle here usually when a small cell is passed through a small aperture a cell is passed through a small aperture what happens if it is an electron iodide particularly and electrodes are in between a waveform is established and this depending upon the size of the cell you can measure the waveform and you can easily separate the rbc from platelets from the wbc usually rbc and platelets are counted in one chamber and usually the small 2 to 20 femtoliters are platelets and from 35 to 350 femtoliters are rbc after counting the rbcs and platelets the blood is hemolyzed so that the uh, particularly the anemia that the rbcs are hemolyzed and platelets are taken out and it is passed through uh, passed through and finally you get the wbc so this is the basic you can see you can see the waveform and this waveform is mainly depending upon the size of the particle and you'll get the thing so in the counter or the counter report in the side we will have this histogram and this histogram has a very great meaning in it and definitely by looking at the pattern and pattern recognition we can diagnose plenty of things 
This is the normal histogram, RBC histogram, showing that here the hemoglobin, that is the MC, this is the MCV, that is a mean corpus flutter, is around, around roughly around 80. So it is a normal RBC histogram with the normal, that is the width is, shows the RDW. RDW is measured by the width of the curve. So here there is a normal width and here it is a mainly around 80. It's a normal RBC histogram. Whenever the histogram is shifted to left, that is here you can see the peak correlates to around 50 to 60. So it indicates there is a shift to the left of the histogram. Immediately we can say obviously mostly it is a case of microcytic anemia. When you we can easily confirm by the peripheral smear, it is a case of mostly iron deficiency anemia. In the same way, when the RBC histogram is shifted to the right, here you can see the peak is around roughly around 110 or 120. So that indicates the MCV is high. So mostly you can see the RBCs are very megalo ovalocytes or macrocytes are there. Big, big RBCs are there. So this is the, by the histogram itself, we can diagnose in, before the peripheral smear. So this case, mostly we are dealing with the case of macrocytic anemia. Such is the utility value of the histogram. So when you see a histogram like this, there are double peaks. So it indicates mostly a double population of cells. It can be in a transfused individual or it can be a, you can a high end deficiency with uh, along with the B12 deficiency. Whenever you have double peak, it can be a twin population of twin nutritional deficiency R and RBC or APR following post transition. You may be having a normal population as well as abnormal population. So the histogram will give a clue easily. It can get, you can easily pick up a dimorphic anemia. Coming to the, this histogram, you can see here the histogram is spreaded to a lower, later aspect. So whenever the histogram is spreaded like this, immediately you can say when you see the smear, there will be a lot of clumped RBCs that indicates mostly you are dealing with whenever you have this MCV is more than 130, 140, whenever there is a MAM, it never any megaloblastic anemia with the MCV will go beyond 110 or 120. Whenever the MCV goes beyond 120 or 140, 130, it indicates mostly we are dealing with a case of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It easily the RBC histogram can give a clue and peripheral smear can give a clue. So that is the utility of these histograms. By just looking at the pattern, whether it's a left shift or a right shift or a dimorph dimorphic or it is extended, you can definitely diagnose many conditions by looking at the histogram. Coming to the platelet histogram, Again, I already told the platelets have the 2 to 20 femtoliters. And if it is mainly it is extended, we can say mostly giant platelets are there. Whenever giant platelets are there, as now Professor told, it is a, it indicates the bone marrow is functioning. And in a case of ITP, it is a very good thing that mostly they are dealing with the ITP. Whenever small platelets are there, when we are dealing with the particularly cases like this, like immunodeficiency with the bleeding per rectum, mostly it indicates we are dealing with the case of viscot aldrich like anything. So that is the utility of platelet histograms. Now, okay. Now we'll go the, to the proper analysis or interpretation of the uh, CBC values. Before going that, we should be thorough about the normal values. We all know pediatric is a function of a growing children. Yet in a normal MCV in a newborn may be a macrocytosis in a older child. For example, at birth, the MCV will be 108. But this, this 108 happens in 2 to 3 years, it indicates a macrocytic anemia. In the same way, hemoglobin in a older child, 11.5 or 12, it is an anemia in a case of newborn. You should be aware about what are the normal indices at what are the different age groups. That is a newborn will be a, the normal hemoglobin will be on 15 to 16. Anything less than 12 is anemia and MCV will be normally more than 100 in a newborn period. Like that, you should be aware. In all the other age groups, usually the MCV, normal MCV will be 80 to 95. Okay, anything more than 100 or simply to easy to remember 80 to 100, less than 80 is um, microcytic, more than 100 is macrocytic. In the same way, we should be aware about what happens to the WBC series also. Usually when a newborn, because of the adrenal surge, you'll have neutrophils in plenty. By two weeks, the lymphocytes will become predominant. Up to five years, usually the lymphocytes are the predominant. After five years, usually they become equal and they reach their adult value or they think that is the neutrophils predominance you'll get only after five to six years of age. In a small babies, the lymphocytes are the predominant series. So only the lymphocytes are very important. If the lymphocytes are very, very less, like absolute lymphocyte count is very less, it indicates mostly we are dealing with a, a case of skin. Okay. So today, 
and the topic given is mainly a lab diagnosis of anemia so here whenever you should know when we say as an anemia who has clearly stated depending on the age group the anemia varies as i already told in a newborn period if it is less than 12 gram it is anemia in all other age groups less than 11 is anemia so even 10.5 you should consider as anemia you should not take it pass it as a normal for example 6 to that is mainly the 6 months to 5 years here this is the commonest age group here the 11 is the cut off next comes the 1.5 next comes the 12 this is the cut off for the various age groups accordingly we can classify so anything less than 11 apart from the newborn period is considered should be considered as an anemia mainly particularly the younger children okay now let us see how to interpret the counter, uh, counter reports so this is uh, the usually normally we go by history physical examination and what we should expect in the investigation that is the way our conventional approach today's this class is mainly on the lab diagnosis today i will show the cbc first you diagnose then the patient next so first we will see the inter- how to interpret so all the green things are abnormal green columns are abnormal mainly look at the green columns so here the first thing is hemoglobin hemoglobin is 3.2 here say it says clearly we are dealing with the anemia it's a severe anemia so whenever the hemoglobin is low the next thing is what is the rbc count it indicates here it is 2.4 million it is less so usually they will grow in proportions whenever the hemoglobin is low rbc count also should be low this is the natural phenomenon that is the thing so so whenever you see you confirm that we are dealing with a case of anemia so next step our eyes should automatically goes to the mcv what is the mcv here mcv is 50 so that indicates i already told anything less than 80 is microcytic anemia here we are dealing with a case of mcv is microcytic anemia what about mch here is a hypochromic so it is a microcytic hypochromic anemia i deal with so after dealing with that is what is the hemoglobin what is the rbc count what is the mcv and the next step immediately i should go my i should go for the rdw rdw is 22.8 what is the normal rdw anything above 14.5 is abnormal here the rdw is high so what are the findings we are so here it is a microcytic hypochromic anemia with high rdw with platelets also raised so whenever you are given this thing phenomena it is a clear cut diagnosis like a mcq question immediately you know we are dealing most probably we are dealing with a case of iron deficiency anemia our country around 60% of the population are anemic we should be able to pick up iron deficiency anemia only by the cbc report and peripheral smear alone and no need to for fancy iron studies this will give a clear cut clue that is low mcv with high rdw with increased platelets okay this is the iron deficiency anemia here this is the patient the same patient's value i have written there it is a one year old with a recurrent breath holding spell one of the twin with a cow's milk fed baby here the hemoglobin is 3.2 even with the hemoglobin 3.2 the child is playing around with the breath holding spell that is the specialty here you can see the uh, particularly the the rbc curve with the histogram is shifted to left that it indicates it is a mostly we are dealing with a case of microcytic anemia okay so now we are clear what to see next coming to the patient number 2 here we are having a mild anemia that is 8.5 grams so whenever i see anemia immediately i will i will see what is the rbc count here the rbc count is high it is not going in proportion with it. here the high rbc count the mcv is slow what is the rdw rdw is normal so here what are the findings here there is a high rbc count even though there is anemia along with the uh, microcytic mcv microcytic anemia hypochromic anemia with that normal rdw whenever you come with this combination your antenna should be high normally the anemia should go in proportion with the rbc count here it is not here the counts are high so and the rdw is normal this is a magic mantra whenever you have this combination it indicates uh, that we are dealing with a case of thalassemia carrier or a thalassemia trait our population have ranging from around 3 to 17% of our population have thalassemia it is a great service to the population of preventing for the next generation of thalassemia major so this is a case of thalassemia minor here this patient came with a 7 year 7 year old with a history of long standing anemia not responding to oral iron with iron studies are normal growing well and active when you do the hplc the hpa2 is 
more than 5.3. So that indicates you are, you are dealing with a case of thalcarian. So magic mantra is as I already told. Okay. Now I'm coming to the case number three of the micro, uh, microcytic series. Here again anemia. Here also the count is high. So that is that also it is not a normal thing. What is the MCV? 67. What is the RDW? It's very high. Even though it looks like iron deficiency anemia, but the count is high. So this is the one thing. Another finding, what is another finding? Here there are lymphocytes are around 80%. Whenever you get a lymphocytosis like this with a high count, immediately your antenna should be high that am I dealing with a leukemia? So that is the main thing we should always have. So-called lymphocytosis can be a leukemia. So what happens in this case? This is a case of microcytic hypochromic anemia, high RBC count and high RDW and lymphocytosis. This case turned out to be a case of TAL major. Why? Because in this case, these nucleated RBCs are counted as lymphocytes. That is the error the machine has made. So when you look at the smear, you know it is not a case of leukemia. It is just a it is a case of thal major and the thal major smear is a is a is a, is a pattern recognition when you look at the smear of the thal major it is the nasty smear you will get all sorts of cell broken cell small cell target cells and nucleated rbcs a target cells scabbard cells every type of cells in the world you can have in a thal major screen so this is the population you can immediately do the hplc and hbf will be very high and more than 90% immediately thal major is confirmed usual presentation we all know from seven months of age presenting with a lethargy and hepatosplenomegaly and having a pallor this is the usual presentation so this is the finding is whenever you come across high rbc count and lymphocytosis is a thal major okay any doubt about this hope you will be clear so now to sum up whenever you have a microcytic anemia when the rdw is high it indicates mostly we are dealing with a case of iron deficiency anemia or a thal major. You can easily differentiate with the help of the peripheral smear. Whenever the RDW is normal, it indicates mostly we are dealing with a case of thal minor and all other possibilities of other rare conditions. So this is the way whenever you should go about, whenever you come across MP, that is a MCV is low. So after MCV, you think about RDW. So these are the one by one I will be introducing, one by one parameters. Now we go to the next set of conditions. Here again, hemoglobin is low, count is low, but the MCV is high. Whenever it is more than 100, the MCV is high. So what is the next step? Immediately my eyes will go for the RDW. The RDW is high. So it indicates mostly that is a macrocytic anemia with a high RDW. What are the, always try to look at what happens in the other cell lines. Am I dealing with a monocytopenia? Am I dealing with a bicytopenia? Am I dealing with a pancytopenia? Here, the other cell lines also affected, but minimally affected, like platelets is 80,000, not severely affected. So it is a case of mostly you have a pancytopenia picture with the macrocytic anemia, with the high RDW. You know, here this is the patient. Here is the patient which presents with a 14-year-old adolescent girl presenting with a fatigue, with a bald tongue, with a mild ictress, and hyperpigmented nickels with so immediately you know what we are dealing with this is the finding which i already told there is a right shift here suggestive of mostly you are dealing with a case of macrocytic anemia and the peripheral smear clearly showed hypersegmented neutrophils whenever you have hypersegmented neutrophils it is a clear cut that you are casing a dealing with dealing a case of macrocytic anemia or megaloblastic anemia that is even a one uh, neutrophil with a six lobe is more than enough to say that we are dealing with a case of megaloblastic mm -hmm. anemia this is the combination. So same way, another case, same thing. Hemoglobin low, total count low, MCV high. But here, the RDW is normal. Whenever the RDW is normal, it is not a good sign, particularly for the patient. RDW high is always a nutritional causes. RDW low is always definitely, you have to refer to the hematologist. In this case, what happened to the other cell lines? They are also severely affected. So this indicates, this indicates anemia, macrocytosis, RDW normal, retic count is very low, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia. This is a sinister combination. Whenever you come across this thing, you know mostly we are dealing with a case of aplastic anemia. So this is the way we should immediately, so immediately you can know they can have a generalized hyperpigmentation with the radial thumb anomalies and everything, so what? So this is the thing. So, so what happens? 
So whenever you have a micro macrocytic anemia, look at the RDW. If it is high, it is a good for the patient. It can be B12 deficiency, folic acid deficiency, or a newborn period. If it is a macrocytic anemia with the RDW normal, it is mostly a, we're dealing with the case of aplastic anemia. Okay, second set of conditions are over. Now we will come to the third set of conditions. Here again, there is a mild anemia. RBC count is okay, it is less, and the MCV is normal. So whenever the MCV is normal, already I was dealt with MCV low and MCV high. Now here is the MCV is normal. Our eyes next should go to the MCHC. What happens to MCHC? Whenever the MCHC is more than 35, that is here it is 37.5, it indicates mostly we are dealing with a case of hereditary spherocytosis. So this is a very clear normocytic hyperchromic anemia and high MCHC indicates mostly we are dealing with a case of hereditary spherocytosis. Here is the patient whom, who presented to me with a recurrent jaundice. When I examined, there was a pallor and jaundice and splenomegaly, this triad. And I also thought something because, but there was no high colored urine. High colored urine indicates whether you are dealing with a liver problem or you can dealing with an acute hemolysis. But in this case, there was no hemolysis. There is no high colored urine indicating it is a prehepatic cause of jaundice. When I looked at the smear, there was plenty of spherocytes and this was the patient and this was the mother. It, we all know that whenever you look at the hereditary spherocytes patient, look at the mother immediately. Mother also had ictrus. Mother also had MCHC, high MCHC with anemia. So it's a case of hereditary spherocytosis. So here is the smear showing that is a, that is the normal central pallor. One third of the pallor is lost in this patient's hereditary spherocytosis. So whenever you come across a normocytic anemia, Look at the MCHC. MCHC will give a very good clue that you are dealing with a hereditary. Can you, anybody can tell what is other condition? MCHC can be high. MCHC can be high in a case of sickle cell anemia also. But there, one very good clue is RDW will be very high. And the case pre presentation, you know, it can present with the mainly hand foot syndrome or acute chest syndrome or anything. So in this case, for example, this is a patient you can uh, be presenting with the hand foot syndrome. When you look at the smear, you can have a plenty of sickle cells. Here also, the MCV is normal, MCHC is high, but the RDW is high and reticulous sound is high. So whenever the, there is a normocytic anemia, there are plenty of possibilities. It is not, there are endless possibilities. Whenever there are microcytic or macrocytic, there are limited possibilities. Let us see this chart. So, and here the HPLC, there is, you can see the sickling. That is a HPS, that is, you can say it is a sickle cell anemia. Okay. These are the common causes of anemia based on the MCV and RDW. MCV low, already I have told. MC high, I have already told. Whenever there is MCV is normal, there comes the problem. So, whenever MCV is low, look at the RDW. MCV is high, look at the RDW. If the RDW is normal or high, dependingly, easily we can diagnose. But MCV is normal. Immediately, the first and important step is reticulocyte count. We want to know the, whether the bone marrow is functioning or not. How, if the bone marrow is overactive, it indicates mostly we are dealing with the acute hemolysis or a hemorrhage. Both of the condition, you have a normocytic normochromic anemia with increased reticulocyte count. But if the bone marrow is normal or if it is a reticulocyte count is decreased, what happens? We have to go for the bone marrow examination. If the bone marrow is abnormal, you come across, come across the aplastic anemia, leukemia, all sorts of things. Whether leukemia can present with an armocytic normochromic anemia, aplastic anemia can present with an armocytic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome can present. And if the bone marrow is normal, all the systemic disorders like endocrine disorders, hypothyroidism, liver disease, chronic renal failure, whenever you have a normocytic normochromic anemia, always see to that how the patient is. Is the patient is stunted? And you, you look at the particularly the BP, if the BP is high and you immediately, immediately they'll think about the chronic renal failure as a cause. So chronic renal failure, chronic liver failure, hypothyroidism, endocrine causes, all these causes present with the normocytic normochromic anemia. So normocytic normochromic anemia is a big chunk where you can have plenty of conditions. If the uh, increased reticulocyte count is there, hemolysis or hemorrhage, decreased or normal, it's a different, different conditions as you can have a screenshot of this, it will be very useful for you. Next, next go to the next set of conditions. Now I'm going to give another very simple. So far, I hope I have cleared some amount of the anemias uh, that is acute and the chronic anemias. And, uh, and okay, now here comes everything is normal except platelet. 
here the platelet is what happens here the platelet count is low and the patient is having a mucosal bleeding and skin bleeds look at the mpv now i am ask, after reti count i am introducing the term mpv what is the normal mpv 7 to 11 here it is high so whenever the mpv is large platelets are there it indicates we are dealing with and particularly the, when the other cell lines are completely normal even hemoglobin 10.5 it is there it should be taken with a pinch of salt it can be a leukemia it should be absolutely normal all the other cell lines are absolutely normal with the large platelets it indicates mostly we are dealing with a case of mostly a simple case of itp okay same again another patient with the presenting with a bleeding here the hemoglobin is low so this is an alarming sign we are having bisotopenia here we are see having wbc is normal total count is normal but the platelet count is low and see the mpv mpv is low or normal normal that is a low end of the normal it is not high it indicates the bone marrow is not functioning properly here some one uh, can immediately see the what is the differential count here what is the polymorphs 5% lymphocyte 98% whenever you come across this type of patients next important thing is you should count absolute neutrophil count what is absolute neutrophil count is what is the percentage of the neutrophil in the total count here it is 5 out of 7400 it will be less than 500 whenever the anc is less than 1500 or less than 1000 it indicates mostly we are dealing with the absolute neutropenia of the bone marrow is under geopardy what is the best indicator of bone marrow is the neutrophils neutrophils are good the bone marrow is fine here the neutrophils are very less it indicates so mostly we are dealing with a case of here the absolute neutro the anc is 370 and there is absolute neutro we think we are having dealing with the lymphocytosis we are dealing with a viral infection it is not so whenever you come across this patient think about mostly we are dealing with a thing when other cell lines also affected and this case what happened turned out to be all this is the patient presenting with a fever and a petit skin bleeds you can see there the, you can see the wbc graph only lymphocytes are there Neut neutrophils are not there it's a pattern recognition and you can see only the neutrophils no lymphocytes are there and here this is the thing this is the patient with the presenting with the splenomegaly along with the fever and having plenty of blood cells blood cells in the marrow blood cells in the smear okay that thing uh, next come again another one thing here again a patient presenting with bleeding bleeding per rectum from this when the younger age 3 months old baby 2 months old baby coming with otherwise absolutely breastfed baby there is no point in having a bleeding per rectum in this young age and having a failure to thrive also so whenever you have a bleeding per rectum and failure to thrive younger age when the platelet count is low look at the mpv that is a very important here the mpv is very very small and smear when you look at the smear there are very small platelets or micro platelets whenever you come across such patients it can be a miscott aldrich syndrome or they present particularly with a recurrent infections in the older age group the younger age group mainly the eczema and the bleeding per rectum will give the clue that we are dealing with a case of miscott aldrich syndrome so just by looking at the mpv we can diagnose am i dealing with itp am i dealing with miscott aldrich syndrome am i dealing with other things okay so this is the last patient last case and here like which i already told here anybody can this is the, the other things are fine here the total count is only that is a 2800 anything less than 500 is leukopenia here you see what happens here again you have to calculate here the neutrophils are 87% okay so bone marrow must be reasonably normal what is the lymphocyte 13 here you have to calculate absolute lymphocyte count whenever a patient young baby coming with a recurrent infection with a failure to thrive with a history of sibling death immediately starts calculating absolute lymphocyte count whenever you have a in this patient the alc is only 364 even this is the best screening test even in a cord blood when there are sibling death immediately you can find it out that you are dealing with a case of a particularly a case of skid so this is a case of skid so so like anc alc is also important in a sp specifically a small babies with a recurrent infection alc is very very important okay so this is a skid so far this is a patient which are uh, with uh, that is a disseminated bcgosis with the skid and a recur uh, recurrent of that is a plenty of mus molluscum with the skid so in these cases with a simple cbc we can immediately diagnose a case of a skid so what are the terminologies so far i have that is mainly told you these are the very simple there are plenty of exceptions and plenty of things as a postgraduate students 
if you master this whenever you when the patient comes with the strip of the particularly you ask them to bring the strip or attach the strip in the case sheet and you see the histogram and you see all these points particularly all the indices starting with the hemoglobin and the counts mcv i have already introduced what is the importance of mcv what is the importance of rdw what is the importance of mchc what is the importance of mpv and absolute neutrophil count absolute lymphocyte count along with the histograms definitely we can you can actually easily diagnose innumerable conditions in your day to day particularly it will be a very interesting exercise whenever you come across a patient with anemia or bleeding we are going through the cbc and the peripheral smear and along with the peripheral smear along with the histogram along with the clinical findings immediately you can narrow down the diagnosis around 95% of the time you can narrow down the diagnosis and finally you can go for the confirmatory test for example thalassemia hplc or in case of uh, uh, sickle cell anemia sickling test or in a case of hereditary spherocytosis osmotic fragility test like that you can go for the confirmatory test immediately 95% of the diagnosis can be made by history clinical examination and a focused investigation like cbc and peripheral smear and immediately you can diagnose yeah, like so only i told yeah, primary hematological problems like anemia and thrombocytopenia along with the smear study utility of value of cbc is phenomenal by repeated practice you can easily master the cbc and its application in day to day conditions is really wonderful and definitely have a nice year ahead and definitely you can go ahead from the next tomorrow onwards you see the you ask for the strip from the you ask the particularly the lab person to attach the strip and see the strip you can particularly all the machines will have the you can have a plenty of conditions you can diagnose by the thing thank you thank you very much thank you dr palni raman any questions from anybody any doubts I think Palni Raman, you have always been talking about CBC is so important even in the first two three days of fever to differentiate a probable bacterial from viral infection. Just speak for two minutes on this aspect. <clears throat> CBC, as such, first forty eight hours of uh, any illness, better not to do CBC unless the patient is sick. definitely better not to venture into cbc if the patient is sick definitely cbc and crp has value when the patient is not having any focus and the child is playing around behaviorally normal it is only a stress response you will have a neutrophilic leukocytosis with 80% neutrophil and having and and having total count around 20000 25000 so first two days of fever better not to do cbc in in a well child with a fever now so cbc by after 72 hours when you start doing cbc and having neutrophilic leukocytosis that what do i mean when the total count is more than 15000 and the neutrophil is more than 80% that is absolute neutrophil count more than 10000 total count more than 15000 anc more than 10000 there is a probability 60% chance that you may be having serious bacterial infection you may be having from head to foot like top compartment meningitis or a middle compartment pneumonia or lower compartment pyelonephritis but it is only a 60% chance all the lat, uh, wonderful journals have clearly said the sensitivity and specificity of cbc in diagnosing serious bacterial infection is around only 60 to 70% not 100% so though to, that is neutrophilic leukocytosis is not equal to sbi is not equal to streptoxone this should be the carry on message for all the patient all the all the audience here because in now the season what we are facing is adenoviral infection now plenty of fever with conjunctivitis or without conjunctivitis we are facing for the past one month all the patient coming even on third day or fourth day we are doing the cbc the total count is around 20000 neutrophilia is around around absolute anc is 20 12000 and the crp some people come with the crp i don't do crp the see them people come with the crp of 100 all these things only gets only inflammation even a viral infection like adenovirus can induce a severe inflammation and produce such things so it it indicates only a inflammation it can be infective inflammation or a non infective inflammation among the infection it can be a viruses like adenovirus can induce a severe inflammation 
and produce a neutrophil leukocytosis or it can be bacterial or it can be a non infective like like for example esojo esojo are on particularly on day 7 or day 8 of fever after ruling out the bacterial conditions and you will think about the kd or esojo are like conditions it can even there you will have a high neutrophil leukocytosis so everything neutrophil leukocytosis should be taken with a pinch of salt first two days it is a stress phenomenon or any asthmatic child status asthmaticus when you see the smear when you see the cbc is a strip there will be total count will be high neutrophilia will be there when the child is recurrently vomiting that will there will be neutrophilia when the child has severe abdominal pain there will be neutrophilia when the child is seizing recurring seizures there will be neutrophilia all the stresses can bring the marginated neutrophil to the circulation and the neutrophil can be very high misleading you that you are dealing with the infection it is not an infection so you have always clinical and take a cbc with a pinch of salt and correlate everything then only we have to go through particular in, in your day to day particularly post graduate routine routine rounds also thank you thank you dr palni any other questions okay thank you dr palni for that excellent uh, talk on lab diagnosis of anemia so thank you all our online viewers also we'll meet next thursday once again and uh, same at 6 o'clock we'll have one case and one topic for discussion thank you uh, thank you uh, rajesh and everyone thank you thank you the students thank you from <clears throat>